Okay. So we just got done factoring. We learned about how to factor, find the um, factors of um, trinomials, binomials. And today we're going to just add on to that, and it's going to be really, really easy. Okay? Sometimes you'll see this title, Solving Equations by Factoring, as asking you to find the zeros. <clears throat> All right? If you already know how to factor, this will be really easy for you today, okay? So let's start out with, first of all, you're going to see two types of equations. It'll either say y equals, let's say, x squared plus 7x plus 10. Or you may see it, x squared plus x minus 42 equals 0, okay? And if you remember um, a while ago, remember I gave you... Like, our book just factors these problems in after each section. The old book kind of does it as a separate section. That's kind of why I like it. I don't want to throw too much at you at once. So do you remember me giving you problems before and saying, just kind of ignore the equal zero? Ignore the equal zero. I used them for you to just practice the factoring part. So now it's time to not ignore the equal zero and figure out what this means. So these kind of mean the same thing. Because it has a y equals, it's written in function form. And this is just written as an equation. So, the good news is you already pretty much know how to do the hard part of this. You are just going to factor these trinomials the way you just did yesterday. Okay? So, you would just set it up to factor, except you're going to keep that equal zero there, okay? So, I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say x times x gave me x squared. It's no coefficient. They're not perfect squares. So, you should look at this and say, oh, basic factoring. What two numbers are going to multiply to give me 10 but add to give me 7? That's easy. That's a positive 5 and a positive 2. And at that point, you are done, right? Okay, we're going to take it one step further, but let's factor this one. So this would factor into an x times an x. Here, my product is negative, which means I multiplied a positive times a negative. And my sum is a positive 1. So the two factors that I'm thinking of are 6 and 7, right? And if I want the 1 to be positive... The 7 has to go with the positive. And so that got us up through yesterday. And today, here is what's new. So the first thing you are going to do with these equations are first factor them and then solve them. So step 1 is going to be to factor them like you already know how. Step 2 is going to be solve, although you don't really know what I mean by solve yet, right? So let's talk about what that means. So let's go down here and talk about something that you learned in, oh, I don't know, second grade. When did you learn multiplication facts? Um, and you learned your zeros, right? Your zeros and your ones were the easiest because anything times zero was always zero. So you remember like flying through those mad minute sheets in third grade thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so smart because everything is zero or whatever. Okay, well... We're going to recall on that property, and we're going to give it a name today. So you just told me that any number times 0 equals 0, right? And that's called the zero product property. And we use this property to help us find the zeros in algebra. So what you're telling me is, is that if the product is 0, that either 1 or potentially both of the factors are zero? Yes, but at least one of them has to be zero. If I'm multiplying a set of 100 numbers and only one of them is zero, what's your answer? Zero, okay? So that kind of leads us to think that this factor times this factor gave me an answer of zero. That means that one or both of these parentheses is equal to zero, right? So then what I'm asking you is, if I take this and make it equal to 0, what would x have to be? What, it would have to be negative 7, right? Because when I do this, I get x as a negative 7. And think about that. If I make x negative 7 and then add 7 to it, doesn't this parenthesis equal 0? So wouldn't that work? So negative 7 is going to be considered one of my zeros. What would six, uh, x need to be here? I just said it. For this parenthesis to equal 0. 6, right? So I'm going to take x minus 6, set it equal to 0, solve it, and x equals 6. So these two things are called my zeros. 
over here, and I know what you're thinking. Like, so literally, what was what would x need to equal here to give me a zero? Negative five. In this parenthesis, x would need to be negative two. So eventually, people look at it and go, oh, so all you really do is look at the number and take the opposite of it? Pretty much. If you're looking at a positive two, then you know that that has to be a negative two. If you're looking at a negative six, then you know that this has to be a positive six. So these are your zeros, okay? However, for today, and you're going to see why in a minute, this step is going to be necessary for you to show. So yes, you have to show that for right now. I'll show you why in a minute. Okay, now side note. Before we go any further, so you're going to want to get out some notes, um, we got to talk about what zeros mean. And your whole linear world is about to be flipped upside down. You guys are linear masters, right? Everything we've done all last year, all this year, and we're almost in May now, has been based on lines, 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 straight lines, right? So when I asked you to graph things and you at graph y equals one half x plus four, when you hit graph, it was a straight line. Oops, I just hit clear. One half x plus four. When you graphed it, it was a straight line, wasn't it? We have never seen any types of curves or anything. Well, that is changing. So let me just kind of remind you, like we say one half x plus four, that was a straight line, so we called that linear, correct? What was the degree of this polynomial here? Do you remember how to find the degree of it? What's the highest exponent you see for the x? One. So dealing with first degrees give you a straight line, which means linear. We're not dealing with first degree polynomials, are we? We're dealing with something called second degree polynomials. In a second degree polynomial, I want you to, t um, <clears throat> is going to give you a hint of, as to what that shape is like. You're not going to see this till next week, but I just want to show you. What was this point in a linear function? That point at the very end was where the, it, good, it was the y-intercept. So we knew that's where the line touched the y-axis at. So I want to show you something because these two zeros are going to mean something to you. And you're not going to see it now, but I'm going to go back to y equals and I'm going to clear this out. And I'm just going to, um, let's do this one. I'm just going to type in y equals x squared plus x um, minus 42. I don't know if it's going to show up on the window that I have, but let's just kind of see. What, there we go. It's, hold on. It's coming. There we go. Okay. It's not the full shape that I wanted you to see, but what I do want you to see is what did we say the zeros were? Negative 7 and positive 6. So where do you see negative 7 and positive 6? On the, well, which ones? Well, actually, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to clear you out because I need you to get a better picture of this. So we're going to do y equals not that one, but we're going to do y equals x squared plus 7x plus, it's going to be close. Nasser was um, picturing, okay, watch this. Yeah? Okay, not necessarily a V, but more like a U. Okay, V would be something called absolute value functions. This is our new shape. This is the shape we are going to study. We're going to talk about um, what makes it be in the place that it's in, what makes it open upward. Sometimes it's going to open downward. Sometimes it's going to be really, really wide. Sometimes it's going to be really, really narrow. Sometimes it'll be up here, but we're going to learn all those things about it. But the first thing we're going to learn about it today is that when I typed this in right here, what connection do you see with this negative 5 and this negative 2 on this graph? It's where the shape touches the, look, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. So the zeros, I need you to know, the only thing you know about this shape right now, you don't even know its name. I'll tell you that in a minute. The only thing you know is that if you go to negative 2 and negative 5, that this shape is going to touch the, um, and because we, we know what it looks like because we 
typed it in her calculator. But if I didn't have that graphing calculator and all I did was solve this and find these zeros, that's all you know about that shape right now. You don't know if it opens downward, if it opens upward. You don't know how far down it goes. Now do you see why I did the other one? Because you thought it was two straight lines, right? You didn't get to see the U part. So this shape is called, are you ready? A parabola, all right? Yeah, it does. It sounds like a medical disease. It's called a parabola, and it's not linear, okay? And how can you tell when it's going to be a straight line? When it's a first degree. How do you know it's going to be a parabola when it's a second degree? Okay, meaning your x term has a squared. And instead of calling it linear, it has its own name. Second degree polynomials when graphed are called parabolas, but they are in the quadratic family. Which is kind of weird because when you hear quad, what do you think? Four, okay? So you kind of have to get that off your mind right there. So a quadratic means your degree is two, and it will look like some form of a U. You, they may look like this. They may look like this. But it's going to look like the shape. They may be upside down. You're going to learn everything there is to know about it. Just like you mastered everything to do with linears, we're going to get you working on quadratics now. Nasser. Nasser. Yeah. That is, yes, this is the one that I typed in to create this shape that you're looking at right now, yes. Okay, so right now, the only thing you know, we're going to learn about this thing, is, which is called the vertex. We have to talk about how to find the vertex. There's so much involved in this, you guys have no clue. Um, but, but we're getting there. So today, all I really want you to know is what the zeros are, okay? And we're le we'll learn everything else about them. So if I were to take this equation... 2x um, squared plus x minus 10 equals 0. All right. So notice that I put a coefficient in front of the 2, which again is a game changer in terms of how you factor. I think there were some of you that really relied heavily on the x factor. And I, I, I wish that you would have maybe given a little bit more of a chance to trial and error because sometimes when you're dealing with you know easy factors, it is a time saver. I'm just going to trial and error this one out. This negative 10 means I have a positive times a negative. And I'm going to pop down a 5 and a 2 somewhere. If I put the 5 here, that's going to give me 10. I'm looking for 1. So I'm going to put the 5 here and the 2 there. Looks like I'm going to get it on the first try. But do you remember how to check? The 2 outside times each other and the 2 inside times each other. And what does that give me when I combine it? A positive 1x, which is exactly what I need. So that's a side note. You should know how to do that already. Now, if these two factors times each other give you 0, then <clears throat> what you need to do next is take each of the parentheses, set it equal to 0, and you'll find out what x needs to be. Because as you look at this one, I mean, you look at it and you go, X needs to be 2. That was a piece of cake. Not so easy. What do you need to multiply 2, two by, then add 5 to it, <clears throat> excuse me, to get 0? It, it's not as obvious, so you do it this way. You'll see in a minute. You're going to subtract 5 from both sides. That leaves you with 2X equals negative 5. So in a way, you kind of do take that positive 5 and turn it into a negative 5. But you have to remember to do what then? Divide by that 2, which gives you x as a negative 2 and a half. So think about it. 2 times negative 2 and a half would give me negative 5, right? Which then add 5, and then there's your 0. So you are setting up these equations. You're setting up many equations and solving them. Um, so this is a plus 2, plus 2, x equals 0. So your job today consists of just setting up too many equations. So now you know what that means? It means that I have a shape. It's called a parabola. It's going to... Um, oh wait, what are we at? Where are we at? Um, what did I just do? 
x minus 2. Oh, duh, equals 0. So that's 2. So one of your zeros is 2, and the other zero is negative 2 and a half. It's all you know about this shape right now. You don't know anything else about this quadratic function because you don't, and I haven't taught you, but you will. You'll be drawing, you'll be sketching these, okay? All right? Now, that's the basic gist of it. If I were to get a little trickier and just say that, and if I were to look at that, it's not a trinomial. They're not perfect squares. You're going to see these, though. What's the first thing you should do? Always pull out your GCF. What's left here is x minus 4. And I'm looking at that. I'm thinking there's not really much I can do with an x minus 4. I can't factor it. I could factor it if it was an x squared, right? But it's not. So here's the thing. This times this gives you an answer of 0, which means one of them or both of them equals 0. So you just set each factor equal to 0, and you solve them for x, and that's how you find your zeros. So x is either 0 here, right? Because 2 times 0 is 0. Or x is either 4 here, right? Because if I put a 4 here and subtract 4, then that's 0. So your zeros are 0 and 4. And that's all you know right now. Okay? Let's see what this, how this would change it. Let's take 2x to the third minus 8x um, equals 0 that change things. I would pull out a 2x, but what would I be left with here? x squared minus 4. And that's a game changer, right? Okay, I want you to watch this. This is really cool. So now, this can be factored into what? An x plus 2 and an x minus 2. But now, here's what you're looking at. This is really cool. You know that these two give you negative 2, positive 2. But what about this guy out here? So wait a second. You're telling me I got three zeros? Okay. Yes. We're not going to deal with three zeros and what it looks like on the graph, but I want to show you something kind of cool. Y equals, and you're going to tell me what you think the correlation be between the degree of the polynomial is. So let's type in Y equals 2X cubed minus 8X. Are you ready? Any guesses as to what you're going to see? A triangle. Not a triangle. Okay, yeah. But wait a second. We talked about zeros are the point on the x-axis where the, the function touches. There's your 2, there's your 0, there's your negative 2. How many times did it touch? 3. Why do you think it touched 3 times? Because it's a third degree. So the degree of your polynomial, this is nothing that we really I have time to get into in, in algebra. This is an algebra 2 thing. The degree of the polynomial tells you how many times it touches that x-axis. Think about it. A second degree touched twice. Think about your linear. How many times does a line touch the x-axis? Once. Okay? So you may have three zeros if you're dealing with a three. You'll only have two answers if you're dealing with a two. So this is where people get confused then. So let me show you this problem. What if I only gave you two um, x minus eight equals zero? This one's a little tricky and it's kind of like, so you, don't, you look at this, you can only really just factor out a two and you're left with x minus four, right? Okay, equals zero. Well, there's not an x out here to set it equal to zero. So we kind of just ignore that, and my only zero is four. 
Another example of that, because it's linear, right? You know you're only going to have one zero. So don't make your zero, two, or four, or two or zero. Let's look at this one. Y equals four X um, squared minus four, okay? I had people do this two ways. I was on the factor out the GCF, factor out the GCF. So we pulled out a four and we were left with X squared minus one, right? And then what can you do with x squared minus 1? Make it x plus 1, x minus 1. Because that doesn't have an x, I can't really set it equal to 0, so I ignore it. One of my zeros is negative 1. One of my zeros is positive 1. Got it? How do you know not to make that a 0? Because the equation we're dealing with is only a quadratic. It was a second degree, which means I'm only going to have two zeros. Here's what somebody else did. They said, I didn't even really pull a GCF out. I just factored it into 2x plus 2 and 2x minus 2. And then they set each parenthesis equal to 0. And look what they got. They got negative 1. And then when they set this one equal to 0 and solved it, they got their positive one. Only two zeros. Yeah. We're trying to find the zeros. That's all we're doing today. So if I give you a function, like here's literally what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to give you back your tests that you already had factored, right, into two nice parentheses, and I was just going to say find the zeros now. It's all you're doing. You're taking these equations one step farther, factoring them, and then finding the zeros. That's all I want from you today. Okay? Andrea. That's going to be your vertex, and that has something to do with your perfect square trinomials. It's huge. That's why, remember how I said in Chapter 10, you're going to see these again. Um, once you see the connection, I have this sheet here. You guys are, like, getting excited about it because I love this. This is vertex form. This is how you're going to tell the, the width of your parabola, whether it goes up or down, how it moves side to side, and how it moves up or down. You will get it, though. This is so easy, but we're not there yet. We're getting there. Yes. Find the, okay, find the zeros means if I ask you to graph like we just did the x squared, um, x squared plus 7x plus 10, find the zeros means where on the graph are the, are the is this parabola going to touch the x-axis at? At 0, negative 2, and at 0, negative 5. You're not even looking at graph paper today, though. All I need from you today is to be able to say that and that. Number answers, and that's it. I'm just giving you a preview of what we're going to see next week, and I want you to know what zeros mean before you have to find them, because otherwise you'd be like, what the heck is the significance of these numbers? So you're going to get this sheet. And some are already factored for you. And if that's the case, you're going to say x would equal, one of the zeros is negative 5, and the other one's negative 2. One of the zeros is negative 2, and the other is positive 10. Then you're going to get to ones that aren't factored yet. So you will factor them. Then you'll find the zeros. So all I'm asking you to do is just be careful, because if you do have that coefficient, like let's say, let's do this one. Let's pull out a negative 15x. What are you left with? An x plus... Yeah, it needs to be what? Negative 2. Because this negative times this negative needs to give you that positive. So set this equal to 0. Set this equal to 0. Divide both sides by whatever to solve for your x. One of your zeros is 0. And the other one is 2. That's what your answers are. That's what I'm checking for. Okay? So I wanted to also kind of just give you that little, um, 
you know, tip or kind of show you a preview of what you have coming in store for you. It's parabolas, it's nonlinear, it, they're doing some crazy shapes, and that's what trimester three of algebra is all about. And it's going to take us every single last day that I have with you to make sure that you understand um, how to do these shapes, okay?